Welcome to Coast to Coast AM's YouTube channel. I'm George Norrie. Like, share, and subscribe. Also find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and coasttocoastam.com. Become a Coast Insider for ad-free access to thousands of shows you'll really enjoy. Well, she's our investigative reporter, Linda Moulton Howe, Emmy Award-winning television producer and reporter, author. She goes directly to the men and women at the forefront of science and environmental challenges and does not give up. Her website, earthfiles.com. This is a follow-up story this hour to an incredible story Linda had for us last month. And this all developed now from a phone call that came into the program when Linda was on the air with us. Linda, welcome back. How are you? Well, thanks, George. And that's absolutely right. It was only three weeks ago on January 20th on Coast that I was reporting information from military, political, and scientific sources about aerial disk technology defined as interplanetary and extraterrestrial by the Truman administration. And that disk technology, which the public and the media have long called UFOs, interfered with our V-2 rocket test at New Mexico's White Sands Proving Ground, beginning around 1947, and we now know that's an absolute fact. We even shot at those disks, and there was retaliation. Well, during our radio program, Open Lines, a man named Don called in and said that his uncle from the U.S. Navy had a briefcase that contained top-secret files in black-and-white photographs of crashed disks and entities. And Don said that his uncle showed the contents of the briefcase to him and his mother and some other relatives some time before his uncle's death in 2002 and before his uncle burned everything under orders, he said. And I asked Don if he would leave his phone number for me to follow up. He did, and tonight I would like to share some of the details that Don told me Great. about the photographs and his uncle's alleged first-hand experiences, George, with live humanoids classified as extraterrestrial biological entities. And Don told me there was not just one crash. He said there were two others at the same time that his uncle talked about, one near the Trinity site on White Sands where we exploded the first atomic bomb test in July 1945. The third was east of Alamogordo and Holloman Air Force Base on the Mescalera Indian Reservation. Those three crash sites are consistent with the leaked MJ-12 documents that Bob and Ryan Wood have published and have been investigating now for several years. One is the July 22nd, 1947. That would be just a couple of weeks after uh, the crashes. It's called Interplanetary Phenomenon Unit Summary. Another, the Majestic 12 Project's first annual report, was written later. And you can see, I think, important excerpts from these leaked alleged government documents right now at my news website, www.earthfiles.com. At the top of the headlines page, there is a hot link to this science report and excerpts from these two important leaked documents. Now, the July 22, 1947, Top Secret Interplanetary Phenomenon Unit document begins, quote, the extraordinary recovery of fallen airborne objects in the state of New Mexico between 4 July to 6 July 1947 and goes on to say that about a half hour before the clock turned to midnight going into July 4th, 1947, quote, radar stations in East Texas and White Sands Proving Ground, New Mexico, tracked two unidentified aircraft until both dropped off radar. Two crash sites have been located close to the White Sands Proving Ground, unquote, and those were specified as near Corona and the other near Oscura Peak and the Trinity site at White Sands. And later, in the Majestic 12 First Annual Report, they had learned more, and they talk about a third crash site listed as 30 miles east of Alamogordo on the Mescalero Indian Reservation when, the same time, between July 4th and July 6th, 1947, and according to these leaked government documents, bodies were found at both the Corona and the Trinity site locations, and Don told me his uncle showed him black and white photographs 
of all three crash sites. And near Corona, he said there was a photograph of a disc embedded at an angle in a hillside and two entities standing up alive next to it. There were also two smaller dead bodies on the ground. One had an arm and leg cut off and the other had a Jeez. slice across its belly. Don assumed this happened from the crash impact. We are going to hear him describe what he saw in his uncle's briefcase in just a moment. But first, I would like you to hear the voice message that Don left on my telephone a couple of days after our January 31st phone interview and after I had tried several times to reach him again with follow-up questions. Here now is Don. Hi, Linda, it's Don. Uh, the reason I ain't returning your calls, your phone's been bugged. I've been getting some calls, and I've had people following me, so I'm going to kind of back out of this. I don't know what to tell you. You can call me, and I'll, I'll answer it, but uh, I ain't going to say anything else. You know, this is just getting a little bit too scary because I just had a feeling I shouldn't have opened up, but I figured it was a dead source, but it still ain't dead. This isn't the first time that I have had a long, in-depth phone interview with somebody or have talked with them in person and have received exactly this kind of phone call from people backing away because the government comes and intimidates, even though his uncle has been dead for a long time and the documents were burned. And now let's go back about five years ago when Don's uncle in the Navy was still alive but dying from a blood disease and other ailments. Don says that the briefcase was old crack leather from which his uncle took out file folders, documents, and black and white photographs of those July 1947 crashes in New Mexico. Two brief clarifications. Don said there were no ears on the beings, only tiny slits on the sides of their heads, but he will use the word ears. And he says his uncle referred to beyond our galaxy from where they came and thinks that means outside our Milky Way galaxy, not just beyond our, so our solar system, but he is not sure. And now he begins with describing what was stamped on the back of a photograph of a disc embedded at an angle in a hill near Corona from July 1947. On the back, it said, property of the United States Navy, top secret. The property of the Navy? Yeah. Did you uh, ever see the letters M-A-J-I-C, magic, uh, stamped on any of it? It was across the top of the folder. It was in solid black and big, bold letters, black and white photos. You saw these photos with your own eyes, right? Yeah. Well, the first one would have been up craft on the side of the hill at an angle. Two bodies were on the outside and two were standing upright. The two dead were, one I remember, was just looked like he was split open. Like somebody just took a knife and just laid him open. The other one was missing a leg and an arm. Skin from black and white, you really can't tell. The estimated height would be somewhere between three to four feet. Egg-shaped head, long arms, short legs, long pointy fingers, Mouths were round. It wasn't like our mouth. It was more like an oval shape. Do you mean oval up and down or oval uh, going sideways? Sideways. Okay, so you were not looking at just a thin line. Right. Was it especially dark compared to their skin? About the same color as their eyes. Black and white photo because their eyes were like a, at a slanted angle. Mm -hmm. Was a darkness to them and it took it down to like a little point where it goes toward your ears. The points went toward the ears, not toward the nose? The points went toward the ear. The skin looked wrinkled, almost like it had some type of uniform on it, but I really don't know. And it was just like you take a piece of paper and put a little crease in it. You know how the actresses use skin tone body suits? Oh, yeah. I would put it somewhere in that category. Did your uncle explain how they got that disc embedded in the hill out? What did they put it on? How did they move it? 
was loaded by a flatbed truck covered in a tarp with two cranes that removed it from the side of the hill and moved in the middle of the night. You thought maybe 30 feet in diameter? Yep. Did your uncle mention anything about our military firing at these disks? Our military fired at them, but it didn't do any good. We were told not to tell anybody for the rest of our lives, but I figured, hey, it's time to let it out. Right. I wondered if he said anything that day when he was showing you all this material from his briefcase. Did he say anything to you about why the secret would still be being kept in what essentially now is the 21st century? They just don't want American people to know that ETs or humanoids or whatever you want to call them exist and that some of them could have power to literally wipe us off the face of the earth. Did he say that? Yep. Did he say anything about who these entities were, where they were from, and that sort of thing? They're outside our galaxy, that's all he would tell us, and that they were trying to teach us what they knew of different forms of medicine. They were strictly here for peace. From another galaxy? what I think the government calls extraterrestrial biological entities, that the acronym is EBEN. Did your uncle ever use that term, EBEN? Yeah, but he didn't pronounce it EBEN. What did he say? He said it was EBEN. Every now and then, you'd catch something on news or on that they broadcast from Spain or somewhere else showing this unidentified thing, and they were explaining this swamp gas and all this other stuff. And he'd just start laughing, and, you know, everybody would look at him like, what are you laughing at? And he'd say, if only the people only knew what it was. He told you when he was showing you the photographs that these Ebens were from another galaxy and that they were here to teach us about medicine? Yep, and how to live in peace. They don't seem to be doing a very good job. No, they don't. Of course, the government ain't, ain't letting them out either, are they? It's a very big puzzle, and that's why I'm hoping that maybe your uncle told you something that would give us some insight about why it is all seemingly so strange, confusing, and complicated. One letter I read, it was by a Welcomen or Walkerman, I don't remember the last name, but he said it would cause mass panic if the American citizen should find out about the ETs because they would automatically confuse them and terrorize them. They would automatically confuse the public? Yeah. And the terror would come from what? That, that I never went into detail. It just kind of ended there. I don't know if that meant terrorizing the aliens or terrorizing the American public. And when we come back after this break, George, we'll go into what the uncle told Don about his telepathic communication with the Ebens. They made him trust them even though the government had taken a position of tremendous mistrust. I got to tell you, Linda, great job, first of all, in getting Don comfortable enough to come back and talk to you, yeah. especially after that phone call. Now, he, he sounded pretty jarred. And I got to tell you, for a moment, you sounded pretty jarred uh, talking to him. Uh, you have, and you and I have talked before, and I think you've talked about it in the program. You think you've been bugged before, right? Oh, my uh, phone, wherever I've been, Denver, Boston, wherever, uh, I've had people who have the electronic equipment, and my phone has been bugged so persistently since I did a strange harvest uh, back in uh, 19, from 1980 on, and I've tried uh, not to be paranoid about it, and I've said on the phone several times, if the government doesn't know what I know, then we're all in trouble. We'll protect you, Linda. You know that. <laughs> That was no. This is an incredible story. I mean, it just keeps getting bigger and yeah. bigger. And so I can't wait until uh, the next half hour when we come back. And I'm also looking forward to this chat with uh, the mother of Daniel uh, Burrish. This is going to be interesting. Okay. Linda, let's get right into this story again. Then you and I'll have some moments to chat before our next hour. Okay. Right. And I'm hoping there might be some other Dons out there listening tonight on this coast program, or people who might have some information that relates to what I'm reporting. And my email address is earthfiles at earthfiles.com. It's the same word as my website uh, twice, earthfiles at earthfiles.com. And I'm happy to communicate with 
anyone off the record as well as on the record. Now, back uh, three weeks ago on January 20th, the coast to coast we did then, I talked about how General Nathan Twining back in the uh, end of the 40s uh, has actually uh, been found quoting uh, and having been said that disks were, from his point of view, enemy weapon systems. And President Truman ordered the United States Air Force to shoot down and retrieve disks. Now, what we're going to come up with here in this next uh, piece from the interview that I did with Don is his explaining from his uncle why there was so much aggression and yet, his uncle did not agree with the policy. Let's hear now, Don. Here we go. According to Truman, he didn't trust them. Do you know why? No, it wasn't written. Truman just said to keep them under confinement and not to let a word leak out. And that was for private eyes only, if I remember the letterhead right. Did your uncle try to explain to you anything that he understood about why Truman would not trust them? No, he never did say that, but he had complete trust in them. Your uncle trusted the Evans. Yep. He said he didn't feel any fear around them. So your uncle had been face to face with them? Yes. Did he have telepathic communication? Like a trance state he fell into when he was standing next to him, and that it was just like a thought pattern. He could tell what they were thinking, and they read everything he was thinking, yet it sounded like they were talking back and forth. But it was inside of his head. Right. And did he hear his own thought voice, or did they have a distinctly different uh, quality of sound inside of his head? He said they had a higher pitch than we do, mm -hmm. but it was completely audible, and he could understand every word they were saying. Did he ever say that I asked them telepathically, why are you here, and hear from them directly? That they were just basically here to shed peace upon the world and to teach us how to live in peace and to explain some of the medications that would cure 90% of the disease in the 50s. Medications? Right. His closest contact with the Ebens was in 47? 48. In 48 after the crash. Right. And where was that? Greenland, Area 51, Groom Lake. And that's where he was in contact with, was it one or more Evans? There was two there that he was in contact with. And were they working with our government? Yep. And were they working on technology or? The way he put it, it was a sealed room with a ball floating in midair suspended by nothing. What were they doing? Uh, what he witnessed was like, how can I put it, one room within a room, mm -hmm. like there'd be a cubicle inside of a larger room. There was a metal sphere, what he described, that was just literally being moved side to side, up and down with nothing holding it. Okay, now was the metal sphere inside of a glass room? Yeah, it was glass, plastic. And then there was another room. Where were the people watching this? In the exterior room. It would be like taking a cake and putting a small cake pan over top of it, a clear one, and then taking a larger one and putting it over top of the smaller one, like a confinement area. Mm-hmm. And your uncle was in that outer room? Right. And where were the two Ebens that he was working with? One was sitting next to him, the other one was sitting next to some high-ranking bird colonel. What were the Ebens trying to demonstrate for your uncle and the bird colonel? Defying gravity. Were they doing it with their mind or something else? Just with their mind. There was nothing else in there. Okay, so the Ebens were trying to show that they could lift these metal spheres with their mind. Right. And according to what my uncle said, they weighed anywhere from 100 to 200 pounds. So it was nothing like, it was like for them lifting a piece of paper. Did your uncle understand why the Ebens were demonstrating that for our government and military? Well, from what he theorized and what he could pick up, they were showing him the power of mind versus matter. So I don't know if the craft flies like that or what. 
Yeah, did he say anything about them having hand-imprinted panels and a band around their heads that they used to fly the craft with their mind? There was a hand-imprinted panel on two sides of the craft, one in the back and one in the front. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if that was for a pilot and a co-pilot, but he never mentioned nothing about a band. About what? About a band around their head. But from your discussion with him and his explaining doing this work at Area 51, you understood that these beings probably flew the craft with their minds? Mm -hmm. From the impression he gave me, yeah. And that those hand-imprinted panels had something to do with being able to control the craft with their mind? Right. Like horizontal, vertically, could have something to do with speed. I have no idea what they're powered by, and neither did he. So we're assuming it's all mind, mind over matter. Well, why would they have come from another galaxy all the way to here? Nuclear bomb explosion in, what, 1941? We exploded the first uh, atomic device uh, at Trinity site at White Sands in July of 1945. Okay. That's the only thing he would say. It had something to do with the first bomb we blew off. We were getting too powerful for our little tiny planet. It would be like a Star, Star Trek film where a parent body would be watching over its child. Mm -hmm. That's the way he kind of described it. So did he ever suggest that human beings might have been made by these Ebens? He thought about it, but he couldn't prove it. Well, when you say he thought about it, what did he say to you specifically? Specifically? He mm -hmm. says, we're all probably from outer space and don't know it. That we humans are? Yeah. And that there might be a relationship between what he called the Ebens and, and I've heard Ebens the ones that were in the crashes at Roswell, and humanity. Right. Why, if they are so advanced, if they can control craft with their mind, if they can mentally lift up heavy metallic balls inside of a glass room at Area 51, why would their craft have ever crashed in New Mexico or anywhere else on the planet? Up to the dying day, you couldn't even figure out why there was such a tight lid on it. But he, he didn't make one comment that didn't make any sense. He says, the government will never know, and some of them are actually ours. And I have no idea what that means. Somebody was watching him till the day he died, but he didn't say if it was intel or just somebody, from the president assigned to watch over him, or the Navy assigned to watch over him, or who assigned to watch over him because he didn't know. Why then do you think that he pulled out that old briefcase with the files of the photographs from Roswell, the top secret documents, one even labeled magic? Why did he do that? Just to get rid of it, because that was, he said that was his orders to destroy anything if he ever thought he was going to die. And he found out he was going to die within two years. And he decided to show you all. Yep, because we kept bugging him. And then he burned it. Yep, and that was the end of it. But why would he have been allowed to keep all of this material in a briefcase in the first place? That I don't know. And that, to me, is one of the big puzzles, because I think that Don is trying to describe exactly what he saw with his own eyes, uh, even if we don't have context for a lot of the questions and what seem to be such paradoxes. If... A, a man had telepathic communication with these beings and thought that they meant nothing but peace. Why is it that the administration uh, had taken a position, basically, of military aggression? And to this day, in 2006, I would say that there is still indications that there is some kind of, I don't know if you would say Earth secret war, that sounds awfully strong, mm -hmm. but um, let's put this way, a a stance of not trusting and that human, the human uh, side of things uh, from a government point of view uh, seems to be one of we better get ready and have uh, weapons in space and be able to deal with whatever might be coming. And that to me, George, is one of the big puzzles because you hear 
uh, some people who have had firsthand experience with the what they call the Ebens or extraterrestrial biological entities, who say that they think that they are uh, they have no, no uh, hostility toward humanity at all. And yet, I personally received a letter, a handwritten letter from somebody who was working in an agency in Washington, D.C., back in the mid-1980s. And the letter to me, um, among many other things, said, and we know the Ebens lie, L-I-E. <laughs> I have never been able to get more details about that, but I think that that gives uh, or should give pause that we, if we're dealing with such advanced technologies, they shouldn't crash. And that was suggested to me also, that our government began to wonder if some of the crafts and the crashes were absolutely planned uh, so that certain technologies would be put in our hands. One man said, we know that we were given red herrings to slow us down in some areas. Maybe we were slowed down from some development, maybe we were speeded up by others, but it means that we really are in a, what do you want to call it? He said, <laughs> like watching the Eben try, uh, demonstrating that they could lift those 100, 200 pound balls just with their minds yeah. inside. Well, in a funny, strange way, if you think of humanity as the surface life on Earth, and that there are advanced intelligences who might even be responsible for seeding life here, who watch and monitor. They may not be the only ones, but there may be something that actually has our best interests at heart and have tried to slow down our military aggression. Linda, let's talk a little bit about Don and his authenticity, your beliefs in his authenticity. You know, pretty compelling phone call. It adds to your incredible uh, investigation into this initial story that you had on last January. So here he comes along. He hears you on coast to coast. He makes his phone call. You you do your follow up. He's afraid to talk. You're able to convince him to talk. He tells us an incredible story. What's your gut tell you about this guy? Well, it's uh, in talking with him. Uh, now it's been probably a total of two hours over different phone calls. Um, it's some of the details that he had. Uh, for example, I knew uh, privately and from some of the leaked documents, a place that you haven't heard about publicly, I can guarantee you, uh, that uh, humanoid bodies alive. Uh, everybody says everything m must have gone to Wright-Patterson. You hear that more than anything? Right. Don, without me, because I'm not downloading any information from him. I am the reporter asking the question. Right. He said that his uncle had uh, uh, documents about where some of the live beings and where some of the dead beings and where some of the craft went. And one of the pieces that he remembered was to uh, Peterson Air Force Base, which is our Space Command and NORAD. Now, that NORAD didn't exist then, but what he meant was to Peterson Air Force Base. Which was there at the time. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And, and now when you go back into the documents of the late 40s that have been leaked, one of the surprising things is, is how important Peterson Airfield and ENT, E-N-T, was at that time. And a lot of people have never heard of ENT either. And that's in the uh, Peterson Airfield complex that is now today Space Command. And then uh, NORAD came into the picture in 56 or so, I think it started, uh, when they started building inside of the mountain to build the big NORAD. The fact that uh, our government in 47 to 48 would have gotten uh, bodies, live or dead, to that part of the country makes a great deal of sense when you know the historic context of Wright-Patterson, Area 51, uh, uh, P Peterson Airfield, and some other places. And there's details like that that are not commonly out in the literature. Don is not pretending at all to be an expert. Were you, a were you able to shoot any holes through anything that he said, or did he say anything that would make you suspect? Well, I'm talking with somebody who's remembering uh, in the drama of his uncle showing him material from a briefcase and trying to remember as best he can True. details. Um, the, there are, I would say, 
not only with Don, but with other people, timelines are the most difficult thing. You will find people uh, who are, who they've got an idea in their mind that what they're looking at might be an X date, and it might be before or after. And you will think of, uh, most people will probably think that NORAD has been forever. Everything has beginnings and ends. So you have to, uh, you have to look at the fact that today in 2006, if somebody uh, refers to an area of the country as being a location for something, and they know it now, was it in 47 or 48? Um, I really haven't found too many problems. In fact, the biggest question that I had for him immediately was, did your uncle really mean beyond this galaxy? Because I thought that he, when he said that, that he meant beyond this solar system. We talked about it. And he said, no, I remember my uncle saying galaxy. Well, you and I and everybody listening who has followed the research over the years knows that there has only been one so-called common, uh, commonly referred to source, and that's Zeta Reticuli 1 and 2, mm -hmm. a binary star system that's 37 and a half light years from here. And Zeta Reticuli 1 and 2 may very well be involved in this whole story involved with Earth. But it is also possible that there is a source beyond this Milky Way galaxy. And what is intriguing to me, again, when you ask about Dawn, Don is not pretending to be an expert. He's trying to tell me what he remembers from his uncle in that briefcase. He sounded pretty legitimate to me. Linda. And if it, if his uncle really was talking beyond this galaxy, about 20 years ago, or 17, somewhere in there, I saw with my own eyes a type document with an MJ hyphen number on it. I think it was MJ8. And it was about different types of extraterrestrial biological entities that our government was tracking uh, coming in and out of this earth. And one of the names said not, uh, I think it said source origin Andromeda Galaxy. Now Jeez. that is a, a galaxy beyond the Milky Way. Now how in the world we would ever know as humans on this earth, how would we ever get a reality check on where there was a source beyond our solar system, let alone beyond the galaxy? I have no idea except that we, as the uncle, as so many people who have had dealings uh, with the entities, and I've talked with many other military people who are totally unwilling to go on the record about this, that uh, the, the, the idea that we are dealing telepathically with telepathic communication and downloads uh, is a part of the story. And if everybody gets the same uh, data, that's one thing. If everybody gets a lot of different data, maybe that's related to the man who wrote me the letter in the mid-80s and said, the e we know the Ebens lie. But why would there be lies? Why would there be manipulations? Why would there be military aggression in any way? And these are the questions that haunt me today. Linda, let's uh, talk a little bit now. If you can, first of all, mm -hmm. before we go to Dodie, tell us about Dan Burrish. There are a lot of new people that come to Coast to Coast, and they're saying, who is this person? So I'll let you explain that. Well, I was hoping I could uh, kill two birds with one stone and actually start uh, with his mother and come up uh, chronologically so that we can see a kind of flow here. All right. Um, Dodie Crane, as she's known to people, was born Doreen LaPierre Crane on July 28, 1939, which makes her 66 years old today. She married her husband, John Crane, 44 years ago on December 31, 1961. And three years later, Danny B. Crane was born on February 2nd at St. Francis Hospital in Linwood, California. 22 years later, on December 24, 1986, Danny B. Crane received a B.A. from the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, after spending a youth with great intense focus on microbiology. That I have established myself in talking with people and mentors who knew him during his uh, young years and in high school. Then in 1988 to 1989, according to Doreen Crane, her son Danny, quote, 
received money from the United States Navy for work to get his Ph.D. in microbiology at State University of New York, Stony Brook, unquote. Dodie Crane said the Ph.D. diploma certificate arrived in the mail at the John and Doreen Crane Home in Las Vegas on February 5, 1990. John Crane says he put it in a frame and he nailed it to the living room wall. And now as we speak... In 2006, February, Dan Burrish is now 42 years old, and he has not seen either of his parents since October 5th, 1993. Now, he, he walked out of their Las Vegas home and never returned, and there's controversy about what happened. The only thing I can tell you is, is that Dan Burrish told me a year or so ago that he did work on a top-secret MJ-12 project mm -hmm. for the United States Navy that took him into, specifically, Area 51 S-4 between 1989 and 1994. He says that's the only relevant time of his story. And then, he, at, while he was there, he allegedly worked in a clean sphere with an Eben, one of these extraterrestrial biological entities, on a medical project. And uh, the, uh, I think it was on coast a year ago, amid the increasing amount of smoke and confusion around the Danbury story, I told you that as much smoke as there was, I still thought that there was some fire there, and I still do based on some of my own independent research, but it is without doubt one of the most controversial sagas in the whole history of the UFO phenomenon, and nothing really has been proved. And I wondered, George, if we could start out by introducing Doreen Crane and asking her what she thinks is the strongest evidence as his mother that she knows personally uh, that convinces her that Dan worked for at least a period of time for the United States government. Sure thing. Doreen's with us now. Hi, Doreen. Hi. You can call me Dodie. Okay, Dodie. Yes. I'm awesome. going to let you and Linda chat for a while because she is indeed a better expert than I ever will be in this particular case, and I will just muddy it up. So yes. go ahead, Linda. Okay. Hi, Dodie. Hi. How you doing? Well, you heard my question, and I really think that's what's really relevant. Uh, what has convinced you as his mother from being around him before he left your house and never returned what specifically the the phone codes the cars it tell this audience about what you know personally okay first of all i forgot to mention to you when i was talking to you about the w-2 form from the u.s naval intelligence that john used to make danny's taxes and we had a W-2 form, but of course they were attached to Danny's copies and stuff, and he took those with him when he left home. But you're saying your husband personally saw a W-2 Navy form because he did your son's taxes? Yes, and I've seen it too, you know, because oh. I used to sit around with John when we did the taxes. Okay. Now yeah. talk about the phone. Okay. The phone calls, when Danny was living at home, and everything. Well, first of all, he got picked up with the Navy, got involved with the U.S. Naval, Naval Intelligence at UNLV. Then he came home one day and told us that he had signed a piece of paper that he was going to be helping the Naval Intelligence at Area 51. And he was 18 years old. We almost blew our stack because he had signed the paper. Secondly, after that, uh, phone calls kept coming into our home and Danny, they'd ask for Danny, and I would give them to Danny, and Danny would punch in a code, and then either he would call back or they would, at that time, tell him where to go, either at Nellis or at McCarran um, uh, Airport. What is your, your firsthand uh, knowledge about either helping him, driving him, or checking on cars, uh, how do you know that he ever went to McCarran or Nella? Well, first of all, you know, 18, 19 years old, you kind of wonder what's going on. So one couple of times I followed him when he had his own car. Um, I was a little leery, you know, like everybody else. You never know. But uh, it was true. He was going to Nellis. His dad drove him to Nellis also, and he was going to McCarran. 
And one day he told me that if I would go by uh, Hughes Airport near McCarran, that I would see him get on the Janus airline. And I did. I seen him get on. And the Janus airplane is supposed to be the small one to fly scientists out to Area 51 S4. Correct. Correct. And so, I mean, he told me, he, he told me, he said, Mom, if you want to see this, you know, come on over and see it. And I drove by and I waited a few minutes and I, and I watched him get on the plane. And it was my son getting on the plane. It was uh, nobody else. Dodie, would you say it is fair on this February 10th, 2006 night uh, to say that neither you nor your husband nor anyone right now has anything that would stand up uh, as solid proof that Dan B. Crane Burrish worked with an extraterrestrial biological entity in a sphere at Area 51 S4? Well, let me put it this way. I brought up my son not to lie, and he told his dad and I a couple of times that he had done just that. And I believed him because I believed what I'd seen with my own eyes and what, how he was being picked up. He got picked up a U.S. Naval, and right in front of our home, and I believe him. Mm -hmm. But why then do you think that his life and this story seem to deteriorate into so much controversy that today it's very difficult for people to believe him when he may actually have been at the heart of a very, very important story concerning extraterrestrials? Because you've got two liars that live with him. And that's his wife and... And Marcia. It's Deborah and Marcia. They're making up stories. They're putting out stories out there that are not true. They even got a story about me not being his mother. Yeah. And, and see, uh, when, when it starts going in to personalities, mudslinging, that's, that's when credibility good. goes down. And it is at a point where you have to wonder... Uh, uh, why did it happen this way? And right now, going forward from here, um, I think uh, that we are in a situation where uh, Dan Burrish himself would have to be able to stand up with some kind of hard evidence not associated with anybody else mm -hmm. in order to clear his name and his record. Would you agree? I agree with you. I agree with you 100%. Well, let's hope in the future, Doreen, that that will happen and that as George and I move into phone calls uh, now that we might get more information, uh, not only on the material that I have presented about Area 51 going back or in Nevada to that, you know, long ago, uh, maybe there is somebody listening who may have some information that might help us. I thank you uh, for joining us tonight. Can I for this say time. something? Sure. Okay. He was injected, and I keep saying that to people. In 1993, my son's personality changed at that point. He well, in, he I've heard that from other people who have worked in government hmm. projects. They have talked about these strange injections. Bob Lazar talked about a strange injection, and I remember Lazar said, that it affected his mind, and maybe your son, Dan Burrish, was uh, affected by something that we still don't understand. Well, I know he was affected, and I also know that, um, well, how can I say this? He, uh, his wife, right after 1990, it was 1993, it was uh, one evening right after she got upset, she was pregnant, and she wanted to go home that night. A couple of days later, she brings this guy into our home, okay? Looks like Danny acts, uh, sits there and doesn't say a word, but I have one thing that I know about my son that has something on his head and something on his hand, and they were not there. When I discovered that, his wife, Deborah, immediately picked up and said, we got to go now, and they left. And you're insinuating that there may be something very strange in the emergence of the Deborah Burrish character in the life of Dan Burrish that may also have had a problem with his life. Um, and uh, I would say right now, Dodie, uh, just keep uh, trying to see if you can find anything in documentation or anything that's hard physical evidence 
uh, that would hold up in a court of law, and if you can come up with it, uh, we'll report it further. Yeah, well, um, they've got all my pictures, and they're not saying to uh, Mr. Pippin that he can't use some of the pictures that I sent to him that I had. Somebody came into our home and stole 13 binders of pictures of my son, and now they're claiming that whatever pictures they see of him, Deborah and Marcia, that they are the owners of those pictures of Danny growing up. Well, the sad thing is that all of this keeps deteriorating into people calling each other names. What a bizarre story. Yeah, when the, the big kernel of this, and having talked with Dan Burrish personally about the science, maybe that, I mean, that's the part that we need to know about. And, uh, and George, I'm hoping hmm. that if we move into phone calls, maybe there will be somebody who can help us. Well, you, you never know with this program, Linda, how many people are out there who uh, may have information about him. Uh, Dodie, thank you for being on the program with us. Appreciate it. Linda, let's take just a few minutes okay. uh, to chat with you before we take phone All calls right. then at the half. Uh, Pure Lines, people want to talk with you about the episode you've been investigating or also maybe they have information on the Dan Burrish case. Hey, look, well, I got to tell you, I love my mother and there's no way a woman would get me to stop seeing my mother. That's what makes this even stranger. It, it does and it is and uh, this idea of the government having some pharma, I guess you would say pharmaceutical way to manipulate people's minds has come up long before the Dan Burrish case. And um, it was, I think uh, this is a fair, fair way to put it, that prior to Dan Burrish, it came up as a way to erase memory, either selectively or in total. And I've heard this from many people that their minds, as Bob Lazar thought that his mind had been affected by a shot that he was given also. And uh, the, the problem is, if you're given a shot to selectively erase your memory, amnesia is exactly that. You wouldn't have memory of X. And uh, if, if something like that happened and then combined with the emergence of a person in his life who may or may not have had a calculated, manipulated reason to be there, all of a sudden, you've got a human being who has a mind with a certain talent in microbiology who is all of a sudden caught up in a, a chaos of, of lives that uh, have deflected him uh, now into such controversy that I don't know uh, where, how the story will recover unless he personally can provide absolute concrete evidence. Man, uh, just a strange story. I mean, do, do we even know if he's really alive? Mm, yes. You, I think I can say is. that, that he is uh, definitely alive because he has communicated with some people by email. What's he doing for a living now? I don't know. And uh, when I asked uh, Doreen if she had any idea where he was living, she said that she and her husband still do not know. And yet it's very clear that both the parents and Dan Burrish are at least in the state of Nevada, and, I, and he may very well be in the city of Las Vegas, uh, and that means for more than a decade, uh, the son and the parents have been in the same place physically without any connection. Now, here's a question for you, because you've looked at this for a number of years now. Do you believe the Dan Bear story? Well, as I've always said, and I've, I've always held to this, Dan Crane Burrish, the Dan Crane part, uh, before he changed his name. That is the period that he stressed with me was when he actually had firsthand experience, and that was 89 to 94. All of the rest of the murkiness of his life, the marriage and all of that uh, is comes after that period. That's why I think this is so difficult. The name's changed. He gets involved with a very difficult uh, social relationship with people who may not have his best interests at heart. And uh, today um, we have this very murky world. When he, Back when Doreen Crane says he was a teenager from age 18 to 22, that he was doing something with the Navy. Uh, the problem is, could we get the Navy to confirm that? Uh, people certainly have tried. 
uh, the uh, SUNY diploma of his alleged Ph.D. in microbiology from Stony Brook. Uh, Doreen Crane said he didn't go back there and spend full time as you would think of a student, but that he got a degree that she and her husband saw, hung it on the wall, and that the person who took it from the living room was his uh, was Deborah Burrish. So you can see how confusing this is with all these pieces uh, that indicate something uh, very strange from his teenage years into his early 20s. And when you talk with Dan Burrish specifically face-to-face, -face, he will talk to you about issues of microbiology that are quite fascinating. And we all need some kind of a better reality check, even on the microbiology. Well, his name's being bantered around uh, over the last couple of weeks, more than I've seen in years, and I don't know why. Do you? Uh, it could be for somebody's commercial purpose out there. There's a lot of subterranean commercial purposes uh, around him, and uh, that would be my first suspicion that somebody is trying to do something commercially. Try to profit off him, you mean? Yeah, and that they wanted to have some kind of so-called cre more credible exposure before uh, they unleash whatever it is they're doing commercially. Man, it's just it's just a bizarre story. I mean, there are a lot of different stories, as you know, in ufology, uh, and you follow them all, and some of them come true, some others don't. This is bizarre. I can't put my finger on it. Well, then, when you take the fact that we have hard documents that go back into the 40s, that go back with the MJ-12, we know uh, that Area 51 S4 has played an extremely important role. When you look at that Psalm 101 document that even Stanton Friedman has said, he can't throw it out. It appears to be a training manual about how to retrieve disks and entities. And right in the, the page that lists where they took bodies, where they took craft, Area 51 S4, Area 51 S4, it is the dominant place. And then there's Peterson Airfield that we were talking about, Wright Patterson, and there is a very strange acronym called OPNAC. BB3, I believe it is, and that's where the live ones supposedly went. All right, stay with us. Linda Moulton and I will take phone calls. Linda, if, uh, if we jam them, and I think we may, I may keep you for a little bit longer in the next hour. Are you around? Uh, well, yeah, I'd go for another half hour after the top of this second hour. Okay, we may do that. Stay with us. We'll be back. And welcome back to Open Lines with Linda Moulton Howe. I'm George Norrie, and let's go back to the phones. West of the Rockies, you're on the air with us. Hi there. Good evening, uh, Linda. Uh, Hi. This is Wayne from Tacoma, Washington, uh, listening to you on uh, 620 AM up here. Um, before I uh, ask you a question specifically about Dan, I wanted to ask if you've ever come across a recent um, uh, or military manuals on extraterrestrial biological entities. I downloaded one in 99 that was printed, supposedly printed in 53. You mean the Psalm 101 training manual? Uh, it was April 1954 from the uh, War Office. That was probably it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes, and it is one of the single most important leaks literally of all uh, the last five or six decades. Uh, this is the one that came in 35 millimeter film uh, was developed, and Bob Wood, uh, who was then working at McDonnell Douglas, uh, took the 35 millimeter film uh, via Don Berliner uh, back east and said, I'll work, I'll blow up from the 35 millimeter negative film uh, onto pages and see if I can go through like you would be translating a document and try to get it in a clean, clean text so that we could study it. And I was at one of the very first meetings back in the early 90s when uh, Bob had started working on it, and we knew, we knew that we were in the presence of extraordinary material. And now it's these many years later, and uh, there's been so much investigation of the Psalm 101, which is titled uh, the uh, training manual having to do with the retrieval of extraterrestrial biological entities and their technologies. That's what it's all about. And it goes in and breaks down uh, the Ebens. I think this is very interesting for a 1954 War Department document that on the pages it broke down then two different types of Ebens. They called them one Eba 1 and it called the other Eba 2. And what is a 
fascinating distinction. As you read the details in the Psalm 101 document, which I reprinted in my book, uh, Glimpses of Other Realities, Volume 2, uh, it is completely available at www.majesticdocuments.com. That's Bob and Ryan Wood's website. It's an excellent website. Um, but you find that in EBA 1 was taller, seemed to be what I would consider to be more of a, um, uh, what do you want to call it, a special in and of its own species. EBA number two was described as being somewhere between uh, three, point, uh, three foot eight inches up to four foot eight, I think something like that, smaller. And they raise a question about the differences between the two. Mm -hmm. There is the implication that EBA two might be some kind of a clone or something else. And the last sentence in that Psalm 101, 1954 document, I remember so specifically said that questions had even been raised about whether or not EBA-1 and EBA-2 might come from two completely different galactic sources. Yes. And in, in regards to Dan Burrish and his work, <clears throat> did he say or speculate anything on their eating or lack of eating, their taking of liquids in, or lack of taking of liquids in, the types you worked with, uh, so forth? That specific detail, I don't know that we talked about because I was very interested in what was called a neuropathy. Mm -hmm. According to uh, Burish, when I interviewed him, uh, the Eben was suffering a degeneration in the ending of the nerves, and that one of the trade-offs between our government, this is the Dan Burrish story, yeah. that the trade-off with our government was that we, they would help us technologically if we would help them try to solve what was a, a disease of nerves that was affecting not only the Eben that Dan Burrish said he worked with in that sphere at Area 51, but that it might be the entire species was deteriorating. Deteriorating when they visited this planet or on their own planet? Excellent question, George. I do not know, but that it may be a more species-wide deterioration in a neuropathy, and that if we could come up with something that could restore them, that everything might end up with a very happy ending. I mean, that's kind of the bottom line. And uh, the story gets quite complicated, but uh, I have never heard anywhere else but Dan Burish, and I'd be very interested if anybody in the Coast uh, listening audience has heard. I've never heard about uh, a neuropathy or a very specific medical problem in the visiting or the maybe the Earth is theirs and we're the new life. I don't know how to say this. <laughs> well, what's strange too, Linda, is why they would rely on us to bail them out medically. You would well, think that Well, what I'm coming to is genetic evolution. If we are exactly as Don said in the first half hour, that his uncle implied that there might be a relationship between us humans and the Eben mm -hmm. watching over us and there is a genetic connection, then they might have to go to what they consider to be a stronger stock on this particular planet or solar system, which would be Homo sapien. But there's a very, very important piece here to consider. And that is in Bentwaters, December 1980, uh, I, in Glimpses of Other Realities, Volume 2, I have a huge uh, section on Jim Penniston, who was there with John Burroughs and others, when there were over three nights at least, a series of lights, possible intrusions, communication, a whole bunch of stuff at Bentwaters uh, uh, Woodbridge in England. And in uh, Jim Penniston's uh, story, he had also a shot. They, they did hypnosis with him and with others uh, and, and gave him a shot. I think he had sodium pentothal, and they did a kind of hypnosis uh, interview with him. And, and then later on, he was so stunned by what he kept remembering in his own mind about the military doing hypnosis with him under sodium pentothal, and some of it would burble through, 
And he finally did his own independent hypnosis. And this is the thing that I think is haunting. He said that he had touched the craft in the lights where he and John Burrow were running and they could see raised dots on this silver surface in the light. It was definitely, he said it was definitely hard underneath the light and it was glassy. It felt glassy and it looked like it had depth like glass and with these raised symbols. And as soon as he touched it, his mind had all these images coming into it. And under hypnosis, it translated to this that they were time travelers, which might be us, from a far distant future who had run into a terrible problem of deteriorating DNA. And they they were sophisticated enough technologically that they were coming back in time and they were using Earth life as, and this was the exact word used in the transcript, band aid. That we were band aids while they were trying to buy time to figure out what's wrong to survive. And and I know to some people listening, this may sound like really far out science fiction, but you, George, and I, and others who have interviewed people, sometimes even off the record, time travel comes up more frequently than people would ever, ever estimate. Sure does. First time caller line, welcome to Coast to Coast. Hi there. Hello there. My name is Renee. Hi, Renee. Go ahead. And I'm from Kenosha, Wisconsin currently. Okay. And I can really understand and empathize with what this gentleman has gone through. Uh, Back in August of 1993, actually August 7th, I had an encounter with a, what you would call a craft from another place. And I actually have a photograph, which I personally took, so I know it's not a piece of, you know, made-up stuff. And you are going to get us a copy of that, aren't I'm you, or somehow? I'm going to do the best I can if you tell me how. I will do that as soon as you're done here. Okay, but I can also empathize with something that these uh, people are going through, because after this encounter that I have had with this craft, I was diagnosed with a malady called fibromyalgia, which, of course, no one knows what it is, and it is something to do with the nerve endings. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if it's transferable or if I am partly genetically connected to these beings or what. But prior to that, I was a horse trainer, extremely active, never had pain. I mean, you can't, not when you're lugging around 45-pound bales of hay and throwing them over fences. I mean, you know, you're you're doing your thing. And uh, I'm very fascinated by this because I know that these things exist. I mean, there is not even a shred of doubt in my mind. And the problem is that you and others have such a difficult time proving it to the left brain world that has been basically told, uh, lectured, and instructed by governments, nothing exists but us. There is nothing else in the universe. And until that's cracked open... And we can live honestly on the planet. I do not know how we get from people saying this happened to me and everybody else saying, no, it didn't because they don't exist. They do. And they do exist in both forms that you've described because I have seen both forms. And I have had encounters on several occasions, one in Hawaii, one that I told you that I got the picture of in the Wisconsin Dells area. Uh, Another one, which may or may not have been in Dream State, I am not sure, and another time out in the ocean, in the uh, Pacific Ocean. And I know they exist. I've seen them with my own eyes. I've experienced them. I've smelt them. I've watched them. I know they exist. All right, what we're going to do, I want to get this picture from you. I'm going to put you on hold. Tom will get uh, you to uh, get that picture to us. We will scan it, get it over to Sean or Lex. As soon as you get it to us, we'll post it on the website. Uh, And if you would, put a little description of the story underneath that. I'd love to see that. Linda, we'll get you a copy, too, for Earth Files, okay? Thank you. Next up, let's go to our East of the Rockies line. Welcome to Coast to Coast. You're on the air with us. Hi there. Good morning, George and Linda. Hi, sir. How are you? Hello. Great. Uh, first of all, you have to excuse my voice. <clears throat> uh, I live in Maine. Uh, 
Um, the, the one reason I'm calling is uh, you were talking about um, this particular person from Nevada uh, that went to UNLV, and um, you had said that he was 18 and he was recruited by the Navy to work on. I see. I'm not a naysayer, but I find it hard to believe. <clears throat> excuse me, that um, the government whoever they may be, especially the U.S. Navy, would recruit uh, such a young applicant. And is there any proof that he served with the Navy? I know his mother said they had a W-2 form, mm -hmm. but then she started talking about his wife mm -hmm. and, and this and that. And it sounds like a, a, a woman that, you know, is bringing up and beyond and mentioning you know, all oh, and his ex-wife and this and that. And by the way, a post note: I was born on July eighth, nineteen forty-seven. <laughs> that was one hot week on this planet. It sure was, wasn't it? <laughs> uh, well, you know, uh, I understand the question, and it comes full circle back to what I was asking Doreen Crane about being able to prove that which seems at this point unprovable. And the only thing I can tell you firsthand as an investigative reporter that I have talked to at least two people who knew Dan Crane, this is before the name changes, Dan Crane when he was uh, a teenager. Uh, he was considered to be extremely bright and gifted in the areas and his interest was in biology and microbiology. And what none of us know is how many teachers around the United States may be linked into some kind of a program in which the government has secretly kept track of IQs and certain gifts for decades. There's been a lot of implication that that has occurred so that when somebody is promising, the government scoops them up. I've been told that occurs. Americans don't like to think that anything like that uh, that manipulative is happening, but it wouldn't surprise me at all. No, nope, not at all. Next up, let's go to our wild card line. Welcome to Coast to Coast. You're on the air with us. Hi there. Hi, George. Uh, first, I want to tell you, I got sort of a love hate relationship going with you. I love your show, but I hate that it keeps me up all night. <laughs> That's um, right. Linda, uh, you're talking about the motivation for these evens, why they're doing what they're doing, why they're here. And personally, I don't trust them. And one, you and Truman. Um, one thing that you said I think is key, and that is um, um, Don's uncle made the point he believes they're peaceful, and you said they don't seem to be doing a good job of it. Right. Seems that the earth is in total turmoil more than ever before. Right. Um, <clears throat> I was going to ask George that a couple nights ago you had a guest on, I forget his name, but the UFO deception. Yes. And how he believed that uh, there was, you know, supernatural forces involved here. And I believe that's true, and I come by that line of thought um, in uh, Lieutenant Russo's book, The Day After Roswell. He describes the alien autopsies, and one of the conclusions they came to is that they believe they were genetically engineered for long-distance space travel. And it occurred to me that it would take a supernatural power to, to engineer a sentient being um, of that type. And the only motivation I could come up with is, is not good, that it's an evil motivation and I'll let you go with that. Tell me what your thoughts are. I think that one of the uh, most constructive things that every Coast listener could ever do is to say, I don't want to put anything I don't understand into boxes and labels. I don't want to say they're evil. I don't want to say they're our immediate angelic benefactors. Uh, what I think is healthy is to say we're dealing with a tremendous amount of unknown and that the history of our government says that the, the uh, Roosevelt administration and the Truman administration, because Roosevelt was dealing with it too, it's just that Truman really got it in spades. They both mistrusted the DISC technology. It's very clear from the documents. It's very clear for the demeanor that the military people took. Why? What exactly did they have in those documents that – they didn't share with the public, but they were taking an aggressive military stance. Well, I think if you go to uh, earthbiles.com and you look at 
the report that I posted tonight so that people could see some of the excerpts. It says that they found bodies dissected as one would a frog at the corona uh, site uh, without explanation. It says that they found animal parts inside of the craft at Landing Zone 2 at Trinity without any explanation. If our government in the 40s was trying to deal with worldwide animal mutilations that they knew were directly linked to the presence of extraterrestrial biological entities, that in and of itself would have been enough to say, we better be careful and we better try to take some of these discs down and figure out how they work. Linda, in all your investigating, did you ever check into that uh, UFO flap over the White House in 52? Yes, I uh, have uh, read a lot about it. Um, did uh, some newspaper searches, and there is no question that in July of 1952, it wasn't just in Washington, it was all over the country. Um, there were so many, I mean, hundreds and hundreds of reports, but why that stands out, uh, like the Battle of L.A. in 1942, which was an excellent photograph uh, that had L.A. Times articles going with that. The Washington uh, papers were covering this flight of these uh, flying saucers or disks over the nation's capital and getting photographs of them surrounding the capital. Probably a lot of people have seen, I believe I counted 26 craft in one of the photos around the Capitol, this was another interesting thing that Don told me. He said that among the photos that uh, he remembered seeing were these pictures of the disks around the White House mm. and around the Capitol. And he said uh, when he was talking about the White House, it was the most number. I believe it was 36. Well, there isn't a single photograph that I know of, if anybody listening in the Coast audience knows where there is one, boy, but I like to see it, of the White House of this country's government with 36 craft disks over it. Uh, he said that he saw that, but of course he can't prove it either because he's describing what he saw in that briefcase. Did anybody do any old Washington Post search or anything like that or newspapers of the day? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, and there, the Washington Post, and uh, there was two or three newspapers. They all had stories. They all had photographs. I mean, uh, what was their conclusion? What did they say? <laughs> you know what? The government convinced everybody that it was a weather inversion. A weather inversion. Yeah. 20 yeah. to 30 objects over the White House and the Capitol. It was a weather inversion. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> I just uh, put up Boy, yesterday a, they, a fascinating and, and relevant story about this idea of uh, using weather as an explanation. And this is with a man who um, unfortunately must remain also unnamed for protection because he worked in NORAD. He was uh, working in radar. He worked right there in the Missile Warning Center uh, for uh, four years. And he told me they would have what they called fast walkers. And these objects would just suddenly come in on one side of the radar and psh, they in six sweeps, five or six sweeps, it was all the way across, meaning, as he said, these objects were traveling anywhere between 1,200 and 1,700 miles an hour. And he said that they would get uh, men in black would come in and uh, they would have these badges that they had access to everything. And they said, we want every paper your radar records, or whatever it was, on what they called these fast walkers, and that this happened quite a bit. And a, that one of the stories that they were constantly told when something anomalous would happen, and this would be, George, get this, these radar objects coming suddenly, rapidly, right up out of the Pacific Ocean or the Atlantic Ocean, where there's no country, there's nothing that should be launching a missile. And they would be told... It was a weather inversion Man. anomaly. Well, you know, the uh, movie, The Day the Earth Stood Still, came out in 1951. This big flap was in 52. Yeah. So had it been reversed, I'd say Hollywood was doing some kind of promotion stunt over the White House. That wasn't the case. No. Oh, no. And I, at Earth Files, uh, if people do a quick search at Earth Files, they will find all kinds of reports that I've done with photographs and newspapers of the day about the uh, flyover of Washington, D.C. and happened twice in July 
uh, there were two of these floods of discs. And about this uh, guy who worked at NORAD who's been willing to talk about seeing the fast walkers and having the men in black come in and demand the, the radar uh, recordings, uh, it's in a February 10th story. It's called NORAD Fast Walkers and Men in Black. Has anybody ever said to you whether these extraterrestrials enjoy music, art, fine wine? I mean, do they have any creature comforts at all? I don't think any of us know enough. Uh, it's as if uh, the only thing that we hear about are dissections uh, or working on scientific projects and that uh, it's all kept away. The one thing coming into my mind, this goes back into the mid-80s, and I believe that I asked a man that I had come in contact when I was working back in Washington, D.C. on some projects for UNICEF, and I had people crossing my path who obviously were working for the government, and I remember there was a discussion about uh, is there anything like music and the answer I got was, I have heard a recording that is supposed to be something like Eben. He was talking specifically about those types uh, that Don was talking about. That, that's the classic Eben. He said, I've heard something that's been recorded that is supposed to be their music. And he said, honest to God, Linda, it sounds like the wind blowing through trees. Jeez. High-pitched with some strange pitch changes, and that also kind of fits to me in the Tibetan Bhutanese idea that Sanskrit and that area of the world may have some kind of an intimate link, and when you think of the sound of a Tibetan bell, every time I hear a Tibetan bell, I think of that man saying that that music was sort of like a high-pitched wind going through trees, and that that culture that, that to, Tibetan Bhutanese culture that is so fascinating may have some kind of a cultural direct link to some influence by one of these uh, Eben groups. West of the Rockies, you're on the air with Linda Moulton Howe on Coast to Coast. Hi there. Hi, uh, Linda and George. Let's apply some common sense to Don's story uh, with a little thought experiment. Imagine the government knows that a man has top secret information in his possession and, and they come up to him and say, look, we know you have, have, have absconded with this top secret information, which is a crime that will change the course of human history, but we'll let you keep it. And oh, by the way, if you think you're about to die, just burn it. Does, does that make any sense at all? No, and, and Don and I talked about it. We talked about the irrationality of his uh, uncle being allowed to keep any uh, magic documents or anything. And the only light that I can shed on what seems so unreasonably crazy Two things. One comes from the direction that in the 40s, where nobody knew what was going on, we were firing at these disks. There was no question that the uh, government had made a decision that nobody was to know about Earth's secret war or what these were and that the order was out. They don't exist. Keep them away from anything official in the government. So maybe some trusted individuals ended up being the keepers of some of the sensitive material in briefcases. I actually was told that a long time ago, that as unlikely and irrational as that sounds, that some things like hiding in plain sight, that some things have been in people's personal possessions. I'm not saying that's rational. I'm saying I've been told that. Now, come at it from another point of view. There was a man, when I was working on UFO report sightings that became the sighting series back in uh, uh, the uh, period of uh, 90, 91, 92, somewhere in there. We were, I was working in L.A. And I got approached uh, through the phone because I was working as supervising producer and concept creator on that special that became the series. Right. And everybody knew I was there. And I got this contact with a man who was from Hawaii, looked extremely... Uh, Oriental, and he uh, put together a meeting with me, and he was very concerned that his name, identity, not be given out, um, and the story he told boiled down, just like uh, some people have questioned Danny uh, uh, Crane being approached when he was 18. This boy said, 
When he was in high school, he was approached in Hawaii by the Central Intelligence Agency to do what? To work for the agency in Vietnam and Laos during the Vietnam War because he would fit in to that racial-looking group. And he said, I was trained intensely, and it was a big, long, involved story. He finally felt very, he told me, he felt like that he could potentially lose his life because of the highly classified material that he was working with. And without going into any further details, this is what he told me. He said, I copied from, uh, because he had a clearance, he said, I copied files that I figured were going to be my security net out of there if somebody came after me. So you can see either way, sometimes people might have highly sensitive material for two possible reasons. Thanks. Good answer, too, Linda. Wildcard Line, welcome to Coast to Coast. You're on the air. Hi there. Yes. Um, I want to ask Linda if she is, if, well, am I talking directly to Linda? Well, honey, yeah, yeah, right and, here. and let me, <laughs> and you got to go quick because your phone is crackling like crazy. Go ahead. Have you ever heard of military people who had very high clearance and also access to UFO material that developed a um, problems with mental illness when they got out of the service? Well, there have been uh, so many, I guess what I want to say is implied cases, uh, the brain tumors. It seems like that there is a high incidence of brain tumor deaths uh, in this field. Uh, there seems to be a high incidence of a sudden and unexplained death. Um, there is definitely a link between events occurring and people uh, in, let's say, a military capacity who were there and had firsthand eyewitness of beings and craft and so forth, that they are scattered around the world within a very short period of time after events, which I think is purposeful to keep people from talking to each other. Now, where does it escalate that our government would do something to cause brain tumors uh, sudden heart attacks through some kind of microwave beaming operation, as it's been described to me, or whatever it is, to look like natural deaths, but were actually murders to keep uh, the extraterrestrial Earth secret war secret. It, it, so, it flies in the face of everything that those of us who grew up in this country uh, and thought that we were in a democratic country with First Amendment rights and that this was a free place, uh, it flies in the face that our government would be that cruel and that uh, manipulative and that attacking uh, to keep secrets. But when you go back to World War II and World War I and you actually study what was done then, you then realize that the, the theater was set for military control of a secret that could threaten national security, economy, religion, everything else. The theater was set coming out of two world wars and killing some people uh, through illness, sickness, um, uh, pretend heart attacks and brain tumors uh, may be the way, may be part of the way that this has been kept secret. But how in the world would you prove it? I got to tell you, Linda, I mean, this this stuff is strange. Uh, I just watched some video from NASA about uh, an hour before the show started. And I got to tell you, the more I look at this, the more I'm convinced there's something going on and that big government knows what's going on and they just don't want to tell us. Absolutely, because once you start pulling one string, the whole huge ball yarn of string uh, has to start coming out. And once it starts coming out, um, you think of every <laughs> think of every fundamentalist group on the planet, all all over the planet, in every country. Um, and yet, regardless of the let the chips fall where they may, um, how can we continue? to live and work on an entire planet that has been living such a gigantic lie for decades. Wild card line, your turn. You're on with Linda Moulton Howe. Hi there. Yes, good evening or morning, I guess it is more properly. Sure. 
Um, I was born and raised, for the most part, down around Holloman and Alamogordo area. My dad worked as a countermeasures engineer for Boeing, and for a year and a half, he would disappear and then come back, and afterwards, he would instruct my mom that if if you hear me talking in my sleep, take notes. <laughs> did she? <laughs> yes, she did. Ooh, so what were these notes on? Uh, these notes were of uh, whatever project he was working on. Those notes are still in, in, in my family's uh, possession. Have you read them? Uh, no, I have not read them. However, I have seen diagrams and... Sketches? I, I, I've seen the notes. And they are about what? Um, at the time, I was young and ignorant and did not understand what they were about. What are they about? They what do, what are, do they look like? <laughs> they are basically long, extremely long, drawn-out mathematical formulas and some diagrams. And basically, I think what was going on, it was back engineering. Of something medical? Uh, no, uh, basically ways to, I, I think that was the beginning of, Basically, the beginning of stealth. Did did he have pictures of craft and things that he doodled? Um, no. However, he he was not adverse to the existence of um, UFOs, and uh, in fact, it was it was not unusual to go out in the yard in in my youth and see things that did not um, weren't, weren't explainable. And what would, you, what would your normal. parents and people explain those uh, aerial things as being? Um, they wouldn't. Well, were they connected? Were they connected to his work? He he would never say that they were or weren't. Okay. Well, I suggest you read all his notes and uh, see if there's anything in there that's strange and bizarre. And and email me at earthfiles at earthfiles dot com. <laughs> Um, it doesn't sound like he's got much there, though, Linda. Well, I mean, if he can read the notes or get copies of the notes and send them, that I'll would let you, be... let you read them. Yeah, I would love it. What, what, have you ever checked into that uh, Dogon tribe? Oh, the Dogon tribe and the serious mystery. Incredible it's, story. It is, it? and it's fascinating, and it is uh, factual. Uh, and uh, it might be interesting uh, to do a, a temple story. He's the guy who did that investigation. Uh, and, George, I realize we're coming to the bottom of the half hour, and I think Tom misunderstood. I have to get up uh, early in the morning uh, for a project I'm working on, and I'd like to say uh, so long for now and hope you carry on with getting some more information from people and if people will email me, I will keep trying to uh, investigate the most substantive uh, and keep reporting them on coast when I can. Okay, very good, Linda. I want to thank you for spending the extra half hour with us. Oh, I I, it, it was delightful. Thank you, George, and uh, everyone out there. Uh, I would like to hear from you. You get some sleep. Okay. I know these unexpected long hours sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you. Okay, you take care of yourself. All right, you too. That's Linda Moulton Howe, who constantly does some just heavy-duty investigating for us. Welcome to Coast to Coast AM's YouTube channel. I'm George Norrie. Like, share, and subscribe. Also find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and coasttocoastam.com. Become a Coast Insider for ad-free access to thousands of shows you'll really enjoy.